Lord, that is our prayer, that you would speak. You have spoken in your word, which is settled forever in heaven. And that word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we pray this morning that, that by the hand of your Holy Spirit, this sword, this double-edged instrument would make its way into our hearts, our thoughts, that we would see the world as you do, that we would see our own hearts as you do, that we would see those around us from your perspective. We pray that you would root out idolatries and things that are displeasing to you. We pray that you would reorient our priorities. We ask that you would help us this morning to hear you. We need your help in this. Uh, This is supernatural work that must take place. And so we beg that your spirit uh, would be here, would be in us, would be at work for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. By way of introduction this morning, I'm just going to tell you what this passage is about, and and then we will read it together. This passage is about that time when frog demons convince the whole world that it's a really good idea to try to kill Jesus again. That's the title for this morning's sermon. That might set a record for length of title. It takes up almost the whole screen. I really couldn't figure out a way to summarize that. What do you say about frog demons and a second attempt at the murder of Jesus? But that is precisely what this passage is about. Let's read together Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. This is the word of God. Then I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons doing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Magadan or Armageddon. If you haven't been with us on Sunday mornings, we are making our way verse by verse through the book of Revelation. I'm not convinced I ever would have selected this passage for a Sunday morning sermon. But God has. These are the next verses, and here's where we find ourselves. That time when frog demons go out into all the world and convince the kings of the earth and all of the world's population to join together to try to kill Jesus. It's a stunning scene, and the book of Revelation is future literal history. Uh, This describes a point in time that has not yet happened in the future, in a real place with real people. Now, we need to study this passage. This passage depicts for us the last deception of this age, and it will lead to the destruction of all the enemies of God in one swift stroke. And there are lessons for us as we read about this yet future event. By way of outline this morning, I will organize this passage around those three lessons. There are three lessons for us from the last lie of the age. And the first lesson I will give to you comes from verses 13 and 14, and it is this, beware your vulnerability to the power of satanic deception. Beware your own vulnerability to the power of satanic deception. And the lesson for our day comes from the realities of the future. There's a time coming when the whole world will buy the lie. The whole world's population will be all in on a satanic deception. It's not the truth. And yet all will fall for it. There's a lesson for us in that. The lesson is... We need to understand our own vulnerability. Satan is a liar and the father of lies. He is the deceiver of the whole world. He has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they don't believe the gospel. 
This is his business. He's been at it a long time and he's good at it. And right now in our world, some people believe his lies and some people don't. In the future, there is a time coming where the entire unbelieving world will buy this one lie. It will lead to their own destruction. Look at verse 13. That I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. They are spirits of demons doing signs, which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. There is an origin to this last lie. The origin is that unholy trinity. Satan, he is called here the dragon. The Antichrist, that first beast, and then that second beast here called the false prophet. And out of the mouths of this unholy trinity, out of the mouths of the dragon and the Antichrist and the false prophet, are messengers, messengers to the globe. This is a propaganda campaign. It is a satanic deception. And this trio, which will have made empty promises to the world of world peace will be all about war. In Revelation eleven seven, 7, we discover that the Antichrist is there to make war with the saints. In chapter 12, we discover that the dragon himself makes war with Israel and with Gentile believers. And in chapter 13, verse 7, the Antichrist is given to make war with the saints and to overcome them. He will defeat and persecute and kill many followers of Jesus. And Jesus warned us that false prophets would come. The apostles themselves reported in their own day in the first century that false prophets existed. There were those who were opposed to the work of the gospel, even those who possessed supernatural powers, and they reported that others would come after them. The source of this deception is the unholy trinity of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. What is the nature of this Deception. In verse 13, we discover they are like frogs. They are like frogs. I don't know if that means that demons will take on some sort of appearance looking like frogs or if they are like frogs in some other way. I don't know what you think about frogs. Most people see frogs as slimy, uh, better heard than seen, but sometimes I'd rather not hear them either. My family was in the Grand Canyon uh, last summer, and there were screaming frogs that literally sound like the blood-curdling scream of a tortured child. We could not sleep at night. I used to like frogs. <laughs> in the Old Testament, according to Leviticus, Leviticus 11, frogs were one of the unclean animals. You couldn't touch frogs without being defiled. And, and of course, you know, some believe that if you kiss a frog, he becomes a prince. Some believe if you touch a frog, you'll get froggy warts. Whether you're creeped out by frogs or whether you're sort of fascinated by them, these demons will take on some semblance of frogginess. They are three unclean spirits, that is, evil spirits. And the text at least gives us one aspect in which these demons are like frogs. They are defiling. They're unclean. They are evil. What is the method of the deception? Look down at verse 14. These spirits of demons do signs, and these signs go out to all the kings of the world. They have targeted supernatural signs and wonders to convince world leaders. So there have been signs and wonders from heaven. God has been raining down judgments, supernatural cataclysms. Everybody know that something unnatural is going on in the world right now, but we have signs and wonders too. The purpose of these froggy demons will be to convince the kings of the world to do their bidding. And in order to be convincing, in order to be compelling, they will go about doing supernatural things, signs. Paul describes the work of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2.9 as one who comes in the activities of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders. The world will believe the supernatural. 
And listen, the world is already being prepared for the deception that is coming. And I think in several ways, the world is prepared for the deception by its increasing fascination with the supernatural, with spiritual things, with extraterrestrial phenomenon. As long as it's not biblical, it's super fascinating. Aliens, spirit guides, ghosts, communicating with the dead, they are all the rage in our world today. The world will be ready to follow miraculous wonders because it is already intrigued by alternative explanations for what we experience. Listen, don't think for a moment that to be a Bible-believing Christian is to believe that demons aren't real or that Satan isn't real or that there aren't supernatural things going on. We know that there are. Our battle is against invisible fortresses and powers, rulers and authorities in the spiritual realms. All of these will be on ramped-up display during the tribulation. The world will also be prepared for the deception by their love of sin. A world with the stuff that I want, with the relationships that I want, with, with the sin that I want, but I don't have to answer to God, that's a world I want to live in, says the world. So this last deception will promise the earth dwellers exactly what they've always wanted. Hey, listen, when God gets here, let's kill him. A world without God, a world without Jesus, freedom to be all that we can be. They love their sin. Before you knew Christ, you loved your sin that way. You didn't want somebody telling you what to do. You didn't want somebody to touch it. You didn't want it discovered and exposed. And when the world can go about with its sin with no more of the social pariahs attached to it, we can just do whatever we want all the time and we're not going to repent of our sorceries and our idolatries and our immoralities and our thefts. We see that refrain again and again in the book of Revelation. The world will go after what it's always wanted to have. Everything without God. They're prepared for the deception. The deception is you, you can have it. And they are also prepared for this deception by God himself. You know the principle of judicial hardening. You harden your heart towards God, God may give you exactly what you've asked for, more hardness of heart. This is what God did with Pharaoh. This is what God describes in the downward cycle of depravity in Romans chapter 1. And here's what he describes about the tribulation period from 2 Thessalonians 2. God will send upon the world a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. What do we learn about this? Yes, the frog demons come out of the mouth of Satan and the beast and the second beast. And ultimately, they are commissioned by God himself. This, in fact, is a judgment against a world that rejects God as Savior, that rejects God as King, to indulge in more rejection, even murderous rejection of God. Think about how powerful the signs and miracles and propaganda will be in that time. Here's what Jesus said in Mark 13, 22. False Christs and false prophets will arise. They will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. If it were possible for those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world to get tricked, then even they would. You might consider yourself rather astute. You, you might consider yourself sensible. Oh, I can sniff out a deception. I'm not going to be snookered. Listen, the whole world will be tricked by this deception. And if it were possible for the elect, they would too. These will be compelling. And so there is this warning now. Why is this written for us? We're, we're not living during that time. If you're in Jesus Christ, you, you won't be on the earth during that time. But this warning has implications for us. There are so many deceptions in the world. And we can think highly of our own astuteness and discernment. You and I must learn all over again to trust God's word. Somebody has some experience out in the wilderness. 
Somebody claims to have gotten direct revelation from some spirit. Listen, that, that can happen doesn't mean it's good. And then we have to be discerning. And the only way to know the truth is to know the truth, the one who is the truth. And he has revealed his mind and his heart and his expectations for us in his word. And so the better you know the word of God, the more fortressed you will be against the deceptions that are present now. And if you've read the New Testament, you know that sometimes the word Antichrist shows up with a capital A. That's the first beast. That's the guy in Revelation who will walk into a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, declare himself to be God, to be God demand worship, force people to take a mark of his name or his number on their foreheads and on their hands, and run the world into the ground. That's capital A Antichrist. It's the guy we've been studying. But John, the same author of Revelation, wrote letters to churches in the first century describing a small a Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist that John says, as you know, is already present in this world. That's the reality. Antichrist is a man empowered by Satan during the last time, a real, literal, future historical person. And little a Antichrist is a spirit, a disposition against God, against Christ, of deception in the world present even now. The warning about the future worldwide deception is a timely reminder for us to be discerning now. There is a purpose to this deception. We see this in verse 14. To gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. This is a worldwide recruiting program. If, if you lived in the United States, uh, 1914, 15, 16, uh, you would see the posters, the recruiting posters all over the place. Uh, we need you, sign up, and you would hear the song over there. And the young men of the United States went over to Europe to fight a battle. This will be a far more global recruiting program for every able-bodied and disabled-bodied human on the planet. All the professional soldiers, every citizen soldier, every civilian turned a combatant, they will retool their farm implements into weapons of war. The, the prophet says they will turn their plowshares into swords. Of course, that gets reversed at the end of this battle when they turn their swords into plowshares and experience a thousand years of world peace under the reign of Jesus. But before that, they're taking their rakes and their shovels and everything they can and turning them into weapons. And they are marching and traveling to one place. This deception has as its purpose to prepare the world to ally itself against God. We learned last week in verse 12 that the Euphrates River would be dried up to make a path for the kings from the east. And probably they will be the first on sight, but the momentum will grow. The peer pressure will be great. This will be the greatest flash mob in world history, all surging into one direction to make war with Jesus Christ. This will be the world's sole occupation, its final fixation, the last mission, the last great crusade of this age. Whatever wars and rumors of war have occurred or are occurring now or will occur between now and then, they are merely preludes to this final assembly of rebellious humanity. They will all pale in comparison. Every world war, every clash of empires will look puny compared to this assembly. They will muster to make combat physically with God. The battle of Armageddon will not be a clash of armies, east versus west, Axis powers versus allied nations, not some epic showdown of world superpowers. It will be the mustering of the world's armies against one man, against Jesus. 
You may remember the last time that a group of soldiers surrounded the Lord Jesus. They went differently. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. This is, of course, not the first time Jesus has faced antagonism. Not the first time he's been surrounded by armed combatants. Matthew 27, verse 27. <clears throat> when the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, they gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. After twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, a reed in his right hand. They knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him. They took the reed and began to beat him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him, put his own garments back on, and led him away to crucify him. The last time that the group of soldiers surrounded the Lord Jesus, he was silent. He suffered. He was mocked, beaten, spat upon, and crucified. The next time that Jesus is surrounded by soldiers, he will not be silent. He will not suffer. He will not be beaten or killed. The first time the world set its heart on the murder of the Lord of glory, Jesus said at his arrest, Matthew 26, starting in verse 53, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Therefore, how will the scriptures be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and you could not seize me. But all this has taken place in order that the scriptures of the prophets would be fulfilled. Do you hear what Jesus said at that arrest? I could speak to my father and angels would come and they would take care of the Romans. Listen, this is the mighty Roman Empire, the world superpower at the day. This is the beast of iron that crushed everything in its path. And Jesus said, I make a call. And that's just angels. Angels are creatures. They are finite. They are dependent beings. They cover their face and their feet in the presence of the holiness of God. They are nothings compared to him. What do you think will be the result when God himself rolls up his sleeves? This will be a very lopsided conflict. The whole world will be an army. But that army is walking into a trap. Like a giant Venus flytrap. The earth dwellers will be enticed to form a massive wave of humanity thrown into the wine press of the wrath of God. And this is how enticement goes. The world will be enticed by the sweet smell of their sin, like, like a bee is enticed by the sweet smell of a Venus flytrap. And the possibility that, that they could go on living in unrepentant rebellion with no consequence just sounds too good. I'll try anything to get that. This is like the fundamental deception of sin. It, it looks pretty, but it ends in the grave. Listen to the words of Solomon from Proverbs chapter 7. He is describing there the adulterous woman, and he does so at length. And while this gets at a very specific sexual enticement, it is a stunning metaphor for all of sin. We'll interrupt the scene in verse 21. Solomon writes, with her abundant persuasions, she entices him. 
With her flattering lips, she drives him to herself. He suddenly follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as one in fetters to the discipline of an ignorant fool, until an arrow pierces through his liver, as a bird hastens to the snare, and he does not know that it will cost him his soul. So now, my sons, listen to me. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart go astray into her ways. Do not wander into her pathways, for many are the slain whom she has cast down, and numerous are those killed by her. The ways to Sheol are in her house, descending to the chambers of death. This final deception, like every deception of sin, ends in the grave. It will seem like a sweet enticement. It will seem to the world to be a really good idea to try to kill Jesus again. There's nothing new here. The attempted murder was there before he was born. Over and over again, Satan tried to wipe out the line of descent from which Jesus would come. The murder was attempted at his birth. Herod went on a mass infanticide campaign trying to stamp out the one who would be born to reign. The murderous attempts progressed through his earthly ministry in his hometown. They tried to throw him off a cliff. Numerous times they picked up stones to stone him to death. And then at the cross of Calvary, they were successful. At the murder of God, the murder of Jesus. And since then, the world has rejected him as Savior and has tried to kill God many times over. Intellectually, by philosophy, Nietzsche's famous declaration, God is dead. The Enlightenment killed him. They tried to bury God by pluralism. So many competing ideas uh, that that one idea among many can't possibly be the right one. Uh, Let's just throw out as many lies as we can and, and bury the one true God under a pile of competing information. They tried to kill him by liberalism, where the God of the Bible becomes another God altogether in the liberal mind, neutered by niceness. And they say, don't believe the Bible. Believe us liberal theologians who assure you that a God would never judge anyone. And so there's no virgin birth, no miracles, no literal resurrection, just a sweet, gentle Jesus who taught us to try to play nice. Do the best you can. We're all good. Individuals murder God in the heart when they silence their conscience suppress the truth of creation, ignore the Bible, and reject those who bring good news. And all of them say, I'd rather God be dead so I can live the way I want. And at the end of time, all the world will get its courage up for one final act in this age when Jesus himself descends personally to Jerusalem. The world will be an army against one, and the world will lose. There's a second lesson for us from that time when frog demons convinced the world it's a good idea to try to kill Jesus again. You and I need to listen to the voice of the one who is the truth. We need to listen to Jesus. And listen, Jesus interrupts the scene in verse 15 to tell us something. Look down at your Bible. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. The speaker here is unnamed, but the words are unmistakable. This is clearly Jesus. He's the one who said over and over again, I'm coming like a thief. This is a shepherding interruption. In fact, notice in your English Bible, there are parentheses. Verse 14 uses the word gather for the war. Verse 16, they gathered them together to the place called Armageddon. And in between, verse 15, parentheses, Jesus has something to say. And it begins with the word behold. Let me get your attention. Listen up. This is, this is like when Jesus says, he who has ears, let him hear. And this is, this is Jesus speaking directly. 
He says, I am coming like a thief. In what sense is Jesus coming like a thief? Well, he's not coming to steal things. He's actually coming to claim what is rightfully his. But in what sense is his arrival like that of a thief? Well, a, a thief is unexpected. He catches people off guard. He wants to come unaware. And Jesus said, blessed, <laughs> blessed are you. Blessed is the one. This is the third of seven blessing statements in the book of Revelation. In chapter 1, blessed are you if you read and heed the words of this book. In chapter 14, blessed are the martyrs who die in Christ during the tribulation. Chapter 19, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Can't wait to get there. In chapter 20, verse, second, uh, verse 6, blessed are those who participate in the first resurrection. The second one's bad news. In Revelation 22, 7, blessed are the ones who keep the words of this book. And chapter 22, verse 14, blessed are the ones who wash their robes. All of these pronouncements of blessings have to do with eternal life. The blessing Jesus describes here, even if you die as a martyr, even if you suffer and are persecuted in this life, it is the blessing of everything, the blessing of eternal life, the blessing of his glorious presence, the blessing of forgiveness of sin and going home, being everything that God designed his image bearers to be. Notice what is prescribed here. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments. This is sort of a command for us. Be alert and be clothed. To stay awake here is the idea of watchfulness, alertness, the, the responsibility of, of an alert night guard, the soldier up on the ramparts looking out for the enemy. The mom waiting for her 16-year-old son to drive home safely. What does it mean to be awake and alert and, and ready and staying awake? It means living the Christian life, not falling asleep, not going comatose, not forgetting what time it is, not forgetting where you are and whose you are and where you're headed. The opposite of staying awake is drowsiness, nodding off, a disregard of danger. It's getting comfortable in the world that is about to burn. The house is on fire. The ceiling beams are coming down. All the occupants are in mortal danger, and we're having a tea party. The opposite of wakefulness is laziness. Not being about the master's business while he is away. Squandering the stewardship of his resources, time, talents, relationships, opportunities, resources. Serving yourself instead of getting the work done. Keeping his garments here is to be clothed, to be dressed, ready for the master's return. Ready when he comes and knocks on the door to go with him. You're prepared. This is a regular word picture from Jesus. The idea of, of having clothes, being clothed, having appropriate garments. Jesus tells the parable of those who got into a wedding feast and they didn't have wedding clothes on and they were thrown out. You can't get into God's glorious presence unclothed. This is about qualifying for heaven. You and I must be clothed, and we cannot be clothed in our own clothes. Our clothes, our righteousnesses, Isaiah says in Isaiah 64, 6, are filthy garments before God. Our very best is repulsive to him. We need clean clothes to get in. To get into God's presence, we need the bright, white, perfect garments that are a gift of God that only come through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to be clothed in God's perfect righteousness. There's no other way. You show up with your own stuff and you will be repulsed. This is the gospel of faith alone. I believe that Jesus died to pay for my sins, that is, to take away all of my guilt. 
and to give me as a gift his perfect righteousness. I could never get that righteousness on my own, keeping rules, doing stuff, trying harder, doing better. Our best just isn't good enough. In fact, the very best that we would put before God is so filthy as to be a liability for eternity, forever punishable by the holy justice of God. Listen, that's a blow to human self-esteem. We think we're something. We think we're capable of things. Look, I got this. I'm going to try my hardest. God will understand. Oh, God understands. And he offers you freely as a gift the righteousness you need to get in at the same time that he's rejecting your own garbage. This is the gospel of God's grace, and it only comes by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. A double exchange. He gets your sin, and you get his righteousness. It's not a fair trade, but it's our only hope. And he says you need this so that you will not be naked and ashamed. Listen, when your time runs out, when the world's time runs out, if you are not clothed in Jesus' righteousness, and if you are not found being about his business, ready for his appearing, it will be too late. You will enter the next life unprepared to meet God. And the only outcome will be eternal condemnation. You'll be exposed, clothed only in the shame of your failures. You will see for yourself that even the best things you ever did are actually that liability before God for which there is no remedy. There will be no covering the nakedness. There will be no recovery of time or opportunities lost. It will be too late. Now, who is this message written to, this little interruption? Aren't we towards the end of the great tribulation? Who, who's the audience for Jesus' words here? Commentators have suggested three options. The first option is that these words are written to the unbelieving world of the great tribulation. That has the advantage of being right here in the immediate context. We're talking about the unbelieving world at the end of the great tribulation, and Jesus interrupts with something to say. However, the armies of people marked with the number or name of the beast, marching toward the field of battle, Armageddon, we've already seen it is too late for them. All who take the mark of the beast are doomed, destined for eternal fire. I would point you to a sermon September 29th of this year, if you're worried for just a brief moment, did I already take it and I don't know? Is it on my credit card? Is it in some computer virus that I accidentally downloaded? Listen, you, you haven't taken the mark of the beast. It hasn't happened yet. But don't take it. If you happen to be here on the earth when that time comes, you'll know it. It will be demanded for you to be able to even buy groceries. Don't take it. Better yet, repent before them. I don't believe this is written to them. There's a second option for the audience of this interruption, and it is the follower of, followers of Christ during the Great Tribulation. The advantage to that view is, is the immediate context. We're, we're talking about the Great Tribulation now, and so maybe Jesus is addressing the believers, those who refuse the mark of the beast. But think about this group of people. All who refuse the mark of the beast during the Great Tribulation will either be the sealed 144,000 invulnerable Jewish male evangelists who will stand in victory with Jesus when he returns, or they will be the Jews and the Gentiles who believe the gospel and are protected by God in the wilderness from the wrath of the dragon, or those scattered through the earth who are on the run, in hiding, persecuted, and hanging on. Their fellow tribulation saints will have already been killed because of their faith in Jesus. Jesus' message here in verse 15, if designed for them, would certainly be an encouragement to stay awake and keep your clothes on. That is, not to get spiritually lazy and not to walk away from the gospel in obedient faith. But remember, the world's days at that time will be numbered. Of course, the world's days are always numbered, but only God knows the number. Then, 
Anybody reading God's word can actually know the number. Daniel was very clear. And Jesus in Matthew 24 said, read Daniel from the very moment that the Antichrist walks into a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, sets himself up as God and demands to be worshiped, the abomination of desolation. There are 1,260 days you could count them down. The clock starts. Jesus appearing like a thief at some unknown time doesn't doesn't seem to be a fit for that group of believers. The arrival of Jesus to the earth will be an unwelcome shock to the unrepentant earth dwellers, but it will not be a shock to the tribulation saints. And by the way, of all the people who will have followed Christ throughout history, I believe the tribulation saints are the least likely to fall asleep, the least likely to get lazy or lukewarm, distracted by worldliness, to forget the gospel as they go about their earthly business. Listen, there will be nothing left of their homes or their worldly lives to live for, but they have everything because they have their sins forgiven in Jesus. I believe the audience for Jesus' interruption here is the third option. You, me, readers of the book of Revelation during the church age, Turn back to Revelation chapter 3. I know we haven't seen the church for a while, not since the second and third chapters of this book. But Jesus wrote this letter to the church at Sardis in John's day. This is what he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says, verse 1. I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Remember what you received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. You have a few names in Sardis who have not defiled their garments. They will walk with me in white. They are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. A letter to Sardis with the endorsement from the Holy Spirit that everyone who can hear it, listen to it, and Jesus is writing it to the churches, plural. There's immediate application for us. It's possible to be in church and to be dead as a beaver hat. It's possible to be in a church that's preaching the truth and to be asleep spiritually. And Jesus' encouragement is, wake up. His arrival for you, whether you survive to the end of this age or whether you meet him sooner than that, will be a surprise if you're asleep. So wake up. There's another letter in chapter 3, the letter to Laodicea, starts in verse 14. Here's what Jesus wrote to that church. This is what the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says, I know your deeds. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot. Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, I become wealthy, I need nothing. You do not know that you are wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you, buy from me gold refined by fire so you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself so that the shame of your nakedness will not be manifested and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love I reprove and discipline therefore be zealous and repent behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me he who overcomes I will grant to him to sit down with me on his throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Laodicea was lukewarm when they thought they were beneficial. 
That's not an endorsement to hate Jesus or love Jesus, just don't be mediocre. That's not the idea. Laodicea, Laodicea was a city that had hot water piped in, but from so far away, it was no longer able to be drunk. It just caused sickness and vomiting. And they had cold water piped in from another source, but by the time it got there through the clay pipes, it was the same mid-temperature, lukewarm, nauseating water. And people couldn't drink the water in Laodicea without spitting it out. Jesus is saying, your spiritual condition, because you are self-assured, you think you see, you think you're rich, you think you're clothed. You actually have nothing. You are spiritually bankrupt. You need the gospel. You need to repent They were in a church, but they were self-satisfied and unsaved. And while the church has been absent from the book of Revelation since chapter 3, the entirety of the book of Revelation was written for the churches. Look back at chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which is this whole 22-chapter book we're studying, which God gave to show to his slaves the things which must soon happen... And he indicated this by sending it through his angel and to his slave, John. Verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Verse 4, John to the seven churches in Asia. And verse 7, behold, he is coming with the clouds. The introduction of the entire book tells us that we as a church in this age are to read all of this. And here in this section detailing the great tribulation and a world that buys the lie that says it's a good idea to try to kill Jesus again, Jesus interrupts this broadcast to say to us, stay awake and keep your clothes on. This is the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ. And it is a call to us to genuine, persevering, anticipating faith. It keeps us in a state of readiness for the Lord's return so that we do not shrink back at his appearing, as John wrote in 1 John 2. We don't know when Jesus will meet his church in the air to take us home. You don't know when you will die. And no one knows when the day of the Lord will begin. Are you ready? Turn to Luke chapter 12. Jesus' message there is the same as his book of Revelation. He says in verse 35, Gird up your loins, that is, gather up your clothing appropriately, and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will gird himself to serve, he will have them recline at the table, he will come and wait upon them, whether he comes in the second watch or even the third and he finds them, blessed are those slaves. Here Jesus gives three stories back to back about being ready. Second story is about a homeowner and a thief. Verse 39, be sure of this, if the head of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming... He would not have allowed his house to be broken into. You too be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then Peter, listening into these first two stories, asks a really good clarifying question. Who's that about? He says, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and prudent steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? Jesus' answer to the question, who is this about, is all y'all. Whoever will listen. You need to ask yourself, are you ready for his appearing? Are you about his business? And listen to the last story. 
Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Verse 44, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But if the slave says in his heart, my master's a long time in coming, and he begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, then the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect, at an hour he does not know, and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with unbelievers. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many beatings. And the one who did not know and committed deeds worthy of a beating will receive few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. Are you ready for Jesus' return? Either for you personally at your own death or for the rapture of the church or for the day of the Lord. There's a third lesson for us from that time when the frog demons will convince the whole world it's a good idea to try to kill Jesus again. You and I need to observe the futile, fatal end of rebellion against God. You need to know how the story ends. Look at verse 16. And they gather them together. Not Luke 16, Revelation 16, verse 16. They gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Magadan or Armageddon. Gathered here in verse 16 picks up the word gather from verse 14. So we've gone around the interruption from Jesus. And they are gathered into the place, that is a, a literal geographical place. Uh, this is a literal gathering. This is not a symbol, not a metaphor. And it is called in Hebrew. That's an important phrase. This connects us to the Old Testament. The first coming of Jesus was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy to a real place in a real time to accomplish real historical events that God promised from long ago. He was born in Bethlehem. He lived out his life and he died on a cross at Calvary. His second coming will be a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy to a real place in real time to accomplish real historical events that God promised long ago. The identification of this geographical location by its Hebrew name connects us to all that God said about this final battle. We've looked at some of those texts in weeks past Let's talk about Megiddo for a little bit. Har, Megiddo, Har is the word for mount or mountains. This is either the Mount of Megiddo or the mountains of Megiddo. And the city of Megiddo sat on the slope of a range of mountains that included Mount Carmel. And on a rise above the plain, about 700 feet, the city was a strategic checkpoint in the Esdraelon Valley or the Valley of Jezreel. And for much of world history, the city served as a fortress and a lookout right on the crossroads of the coastal highway and the inland fertile valleys. The coastal highway goes north-south next to the Mediterranean. If you wanted to get from Africa to Europe or Africa to Asia, this is the path you would take. This is where kings and their armies traipsed back and forth. And so this was a critical crossroads. It became the site of many historic battles. It was often the site of the clash of empires. It was an ancient Canaanite settlement. If you go to Israel to the day, you can actually see the remains of a 5,000-year-old Canaanite altar on the site. It was the Egyptian pharaoh Tutmos III that conquered the Canaanites there in 1,400 years before Christ. And he said, the capturing of Megiddo is the capturing of a thousand cities. What he recognized there was its military strategic importance for all the surrounding areas. Much more recently, Napoleon Bonaparte said, what an excellent place into which all of the armies of the world could be maneuvered. He just loved war. He loved getting people together to fight until they died. And he thought this would be a great, wonderful place to do it. One author records that over 200 significant world battles have been fought there. 
Archaeologists have discovered more than 20 levels of occupation at Tel Megiddo. If you hear that word Tel, like Tel Aviv, Tel Megiddo, Tel is just a mound. It's a mound of rubble, ancient rubble from an old city. Uh, when we demolish a building, we scrape it down to the ground, remove all of the rubble, and, and rebuild as a fresh start. In the ancient world, they built on top of the rubble. It provided more of a strategic outlook, and so the cities got higher and higher and higher. And if you go do archaeology in Israel, you look for these mounds, these tells. And if you start at the top, you get the most recent civilization at the site. And the farther down you go, the older it gets. And there are at least, and they haven't finished this at Tel Megiddo, there are at least 20 separate civilizations, one on top of the other, buried there. One pile of rubble on top of another pile of rubble. It is the most conquered and reconquered site in antiquity. Why? Because armies came through, used it as a fortress, and then were conquered, and the next empire rebuilt. It was a fortress of the Canaanites in the time of the Israel conquest in Joshua 12. Barak and Deborah defeated Sisera in Judges 5 at the spot. Gideon defeated the Midianites in Judges 6 in this place. Josiah was killed there by Pharaoh Necho in 2 Chronicles 35. This is where King Saul fell slain on the Mount of Gilboa in this area. It is where Elijah did battle with the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel. And then across the valley in plain sight of Megiddo is Nazareth where Jesus himself grew up. From Megiddo you can see where Jesus lived his boyhood life. And from Nazareth you can see Megiddo. And so for all of Jesus childhood, he could look across the valley where all the world's armies would assemble themselves in another attempt to kill him. There have been many wars fought since. A significant World War I battle was fought there between the British and the Ottoman Turks. This has been the site of so many conflicts and it will be the scene of the final conflict of this age one writer said, they will gather to the scene of slaughter from which they will never return. What do we learn from this? Well, you need to know how it all ends. It's going to help you pick the right side. There are a couple other lessons for us, though. Don't follow the crowd. Don't follow the, the mob. The mob crucified Christ. The mob will assemble to try to kill him again. Peer pressure is compelling. It's convincing. You, you felt it. You know it. it. Everybody's doing something, and boy, they, I don't want to be left out. They must be onto something, right? And when the entirety of the world's population will gather to one place to accomplish one thing, it will seem right. Everybody will buy the lie, except for those preserved by God. Before then, don't be tempted by what everybody else is doing. Don't follow the crowd. Follow God's word. There's a lesson for us in God's rule over human governments. This isn't the first time that a deceiving spirit went out to deceive evil kings unto warfare. God did it with Ahab and an evil spirit. Listen, God's able to use evil instruments keep his hands clean, and accomplish his good purposes. That will be true at the end of time. Listen, God does not bring about the battle of Armageddon as a reaction to the world's hostilities. God pours out the sixth bowl judgment to dry up the Euphrates River, to draw the armies of the east in, that then become a placeholder incentive for all the armies of all the world to join in so that God can destroy them all. He's in charge. And if God is in charge of the worst human government that will ever exist, he can be in charge of petty democratic experiments too. No matter what happens, God is in charge. And you need to know that when Jesus the Christ comes down to win, 
and comes down to rule, his victory will be complete and his rule will be complete. His rule then will not be like it is now. His rule now is invisible and from heaven. Then it will be visible and personal and on the earth. And he will not merely rule in the hearts of his people. He will rule with justice and peace over all the peoples. That's coming. And to have a complete rule, Jesus will begin it with a complete victory. The beginning of the millennial kingdom will not be a mixed population. The armies that assemble will be destroyed and the survivors will be killed at the sheep and goats judgment, Matthew 25. The only mortals who survive all of this will be believers. And a glorious golden era of humanity will begin with 100% belief. An entire world of Jesus culture and Satan locked up. Right now, Jesus' reign is king over all kings. He is sovereign. He is orchestrating all of history. And no doubt he rules in our hearts. But he still told us to pray, your kingdom come. And when he comes, his kingdom will encompass the whole world and will extend past the thousand years into eternity future. There will never be another government but his ever. Such a complete turnaround of world history will require this complete military victory at Armageddon. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you win. You have already conquered our sin and defeated death by your work at the cross on behalf of all who would believe. We are already overcomers who have believed in you. And even should we be overcome by the dark forces of this world, we will never be out of your grip of love. And so we thank you for the gospel that forgives, that rescues, and that secures. And for now, O oh Lord, we acknowledge your kingly rule. We acknowledge it in our hearts. We acknowledge your cosmic sovereignty. And yet this is a mixed up world. And we long for the day when you will rule and reign. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.